So good evening everyone, um, welcome to this Engage, Innovate and Inspire CPD session. Tonight we're going to think particularly about online learning and home learning in particular. And I'm really excited that um, at half past four we're going to be joined by Dave Guyman. Um, Jay, Dave works at the Bonneville Online Schools, um, which is in Idaho in America. Um, I've known Dave virtually for a couple of years now. I've been I picked him up on Twitter and sort of followed him um, to work that he's been doing. Um, originally sort of um, saw that connection because he did a lot of work around learning spaces and creating really special environments in his own classroom, did a lot of kind of customised furniture himself for his classroom. So I've seen him making his own kind of um, VW style checkered bench in his classroom and these big murals and things like this that just really inspired me. Um, he's also an author, he's written a great book which I hope to tell you more about later on. And I love this quote on his Google Plus page, an important um, part often forgot an element of lesson plans should be the question, am I excited about this? You know, challenging yourself, are you excited when you pre present a lesson? You know, it's not just about exciting them, it's about us enjoying the profession that we're in. And I hope, you know, look forward to sharing thoughts with them later on. Before we kind of launch into the session with Dave, I thought it would be a good idea to have a sort of discussion about what we're currently doing with online learning, um, because there is some great practice happening throughout Ithaca. Um, which is represented around the table tonight, and also I've got some examples to share. Um, I'm happy to kick off and just share some <laughs> share some thoughts. Um, I've been working with the Year Seven class up at Royal Manor Campus recently. Um, I called them Mr. Spracklin's Year Seven Math Champions. Kind of gave it a bit of a title because I wanted the group to feel special in some way. Um, they're obviously all our kids are special, but it's just a nice way to kind of put it across in a different way. Um, and I've been using this site, which is just a really basic Google site. There's nothing too flashy about it. There's not lots of animation or anything like that. But hopefully it gives a platform for the kids to find out whatever they're on, a way of getting the information out. So this was just created using sites.google.com. Um, you can sign in with your IPACA email address and password and just cre click create a site. And instantly it will give you an address um, by which you can share with your students um, and obviously parents in the wider community as well. Um, the way that the mass units work up at Royal Manor is that we have set schemes of work that we follow through. Um, so I've done, it's gone very quickly, but I've done sort of five, six units now with the children. Um, and each one of those, when you click on them, are broken down into the lessons that we've had inside those units. So if they miss a session, if they're not there, if they want to pick up something at home, they want to expand it, all the resources from every lesson are just there and easy to access. Um, and also their homework is there accessible. So if we go from the first lesson, we can see that the learning objective, the assessment points are all shared and activities. What I've tried to do where possible as well is put a photo in from that lesson so it kind of provides a bit more of a human connection with the lesson. Um, because this isn't a blog or such, this is just an opportunity to say, yeah, this actually happened, we did this in that lesson and you know, if you weren't here, you missed out going into the corridor and putting up numbers on the wall and that sort of stuff. Um, the way that I've been incorporating home learning into a lot of this work is by doing um, is by using kind of the flipped classroom model. We're saying to the kids, right, tomorrow we're going to be thinking about um, reflective symmetry, so I want you to go home, I want you to watch this video. You know, it's only 10 minutes, I want you to watch it, watch it again if you don't understand it, if you still don't understand it, find another video about reflective symmetry and watch that, you know, and come back the next day with questions. I want to start the next lesson with questions rather than with an input from me or with a video. I want you already hitting the ground the next day. Um, and that's been really positive. I'd say that 80% of the kids watch the video before they come in the next day. Um, some will do it straight after in the library that you know they haven't got a connection at home. They're, they'll make most of the time in the break times and lunch times or even in tutor time. I, I hear that they kind of tune in before they come to the lesson. Um, and those that don't, that's the, thing, that's the thing they have to do when they first come into the lesson. So while everyone else is discussing, they've got to catch up on last night's work. And that's been for me really purposeful. And in fact, my kids, the kids that I'm teaching don't see that as homework anymore, they just see that as part of the lesson. So I can give them, as long as it's not too long, I don't give them some sort of 40 minute video to watch, but as long as it's short and snappy, three to sort of three to seven minutes is ideal. 10 minutes is you know fine again, but as short and quick as possible. As long as I give them something, it's kind of become a bit of a routine. Yeah, and do you think that'd be as successful if we didn't have homework? Um, 
I think for me, I know that there's consistency with the Chromebooks, which helps. I think um, I think it would be because pretty much all of them have got devices anyway. So as long as you provide something on a platform like YouTube, where you know that it will work on any device, so you're not. If I put, if I if I took the videos myself um, and just put them from a link from Drive or just a direct download, I don't think it would work as well because that idea of just clicking on a YouTube video is much more simplistic and you know that whatever device they're going to have is going to support YouTube video. It's like a standard thing. So I think from that point of view, um, yeah, I think it would work, but I think it's getting them into that culture of doing it regularly and um, having the opportunity to look. What I've started to do now, um, homeworks would generally kind of watch a video, um, complete a quiz, send me the results, take a screenshot of what you've done, that kind of thing. Because a lot of the online stuff, because we'll, because we're not subscribing to a specific platform like Mathletics or Education City, it's hard to get the feedback from what they've done for homework. So what I'm telling them to do is send me a screenshot. And obviously they could send each other their own screenshots, and they, but they haven't kind of worked that out yet. They probably will when they watch this on YouTube. Um, but it's kind of just getting around and trying, as always, to present things in a different way haven't always done online homework, sometimes sent stuff home, sometimes, you know, create a poster, that sort of thing. What I've actually done this term, um, first first week back, is I've changed um, the way we're approaching things, um, and I've given a more open-ended homework, and I call this Mr. Spratlin's Takeaway Homework. So this is Nando's themed, for all the Nando lovers. The older kids seem to love this because they've seen it in the corridor and they have a better understanding of what Nando's is. My year sevens weren't too sure what Nando's <coughs> was. Um, they obviously haven't explored the delights that is uh, um, fine cuisine. Um, but the idea behind this is that, that the children have, you know, these set homeworks that they have to complete before the end of the school year, in my case. So there's more, there's more work there than there are weeks. Um, which they don't really realise, they just see it as a challenge and they're, they're getting to it. And they have to choose one weekly challenge, um, at least complete one challenge a week. And the idea is that there's different degrees here of, of difficulty. So we start with the extra mild homework, um, and it could be as simple as explaining in a tweet how to find the cube of a number. And I've told them that doesn't have to be an actual tweet if you don't want to join Twitter. If it was, I, that'd be great, I'd love you to tweet, but... If you prefer just to write on a bit of paper or send me an email with that in, that's fine. And then it works up and works up. And obviously the extra hot homework, you know, write a formal letter to Mrs. Appleyard explaining how to find the number of degrees in any shape, or write a newspaper article describing the properties of the different types of triangles. That sort of homework I've already explained to them shouldn't be just completed in a week. It should be something that you're working on now and you're, you're, you, you know, you know you're going to hand it in three weeks' time maybe. And this is all about them becoming more independent and managing their time and resources. Um, I've done similar things before um, with homework packs. I did a year five one when I was a year five teacher at Conifers where we did, um, it was a pack on the 1990s because most of the parents at the time that I was teaching were kind of teenagers in that time, so it was all about, you know, who who are these people, picture of Ant and Dex, and they're PJ and Duncan, and that sort of stuff, and they, they, they really engaged with that, and um, questions, um, homework such as make your own, um, I, sh I, showed, I showed the picture of Tracy Island on Blue Peter, and I said, can you make your own set of your favourite TV programme, and I have to say that out of all the homeworks I've ever done, that's had the most positive impact, and it's where you give children that independence, um, and give children that exploration that you really kind of get some good results back. When I worked in year two in Dorchester, we we did a weekly homework session. Every Friday morning, the children would sit down for 20 minutes, and they'd share what they did for homework that previous week, and they would set their own homework for the next week. So based upon their personal targets, based upon their interests and their, their favourite things, and that worked really, really well. And the only child we had a problem was was a really gifted and talented child who set himself the most outrageous challenge every week, and his poor parents would just be completely overwrought because they thought all this homework was being given but he was setting it himself so he'd set himself the challenge to make a replica of Hogwarts one week and the next week he'd want to make some sort of two minute film and it just got far too much and that's when but again good lesson for him to learn to manage your time effectively and to reduce the kind of need so I like this style of things and I think it's interesting and obviously I've kind of diverted from online learning here but these things that we know to be good learning you know choice the ability to explore, the ability to challenge yourself, we need to ensure that whatever online learning we're doing and whatever home learning we're doing, we allow opportunities for that to happen as well because we know it's good learning, we know it makes sense. Um, so that's why we need to try and move away from that kind of one model fits all. 
In terms of opportunities for home learning, there's some great things we're already doing. So if we go to the new section of a website, there's now a range of blogs that are starting to pop up um, from different year groups. And please have two of those blogs represented here tonight, as it were. And um, you know, blogs are a fantastic platform to share homework, both the successes of homework, you know, work that children have done for homework, and also weekly challenges. So um, I know in my last school, I would set a challenge such as go home and discuss what you've done and add a comment to the blog, you know, about what your parents think about your learning today. Those sorts of things can be really powerful, especially at the primary phase. You know, so you're saying to them, you know, go away. Your homework this week is to comment. Your homework this week is to look at another blog within IPACA, for example. That would be a great piece of homework and to do a comment. So it's about developing that collective kind of response and discussion there. And obviously that, that doesn't have to just be blogs. It could be tweets. It could be um, parts of the website, other things like that. It's just developing that kind of um, e-awareness. And then you can sort of, you can branch out from that then. And there's different projects that, that are out there in the world. Um, where they do look for things for comments and things. So there's an example. There's a hundred word challenge blog um, that a lady called Julia Skinner runs. Um, if you just type hundred word challenge into Google, it'll pop up. The hundred word challenge is a weekly challenge for students to write a hundred words based upon a visual stimulus. So it's a great thing for homework, you know, particularly for key stage two, to say, okay, you've got to write a hundred words, and it is a, they they have to write exactly a hundred words, not ninety nine or one hundred and one. The challenge is to get it to exactly a hundred words. And of course, some students write reams and reams and reams and then realise they've written too much and they have to refine their work. And others, it's a challenge to write 100 words. And this stimuli is great because you then put it onto a blog, you know, or the school website, wherever it may be, an area, and then you post the link to this 100-word challenge website. And there are a team of people that are dedicated, you know, most of them are previous teachers, now retired, or friends of, um, friends of friends sort of thing. And they will go on and comment on the children's work. And they'll leave comments that are you know, encouraging, but it'll also give them a point to improve on, you know, that they, they are reflective and deliberately um, useful comments. And we've done that project here at IPACA. We did it some year sevens last year. Um, and it was amazing how many comments they did get from that. For younger children, there is a sen there's a 10 sentence challenge, um, which is, you know, a bit, a bit more accessible than 100 words. But, for, but there's no limits, really, is there? Sometimes we can We've got kids that can do it, and sometimes um, we may look for something a bit different, or they may want to work in pairs. Um, so, hundred challenges definitely want to recommend. The other thing is quad blogging. So, David Mitchell, who's Deputy Mitchell on Twitter, um, has set up quad blogging. Quad blogging is where you commit to joining a quad of blogs. So, if your class is writing and sharing what they're doing on a weekly basis, you join with three other schools or three other classes that are doing the same thing. It doesn't have to be in the topic that you're doing. It could be in a completely different area and a completely different age range. But the idea is that across the four weeks, everybody gets comments in their blogs. The first week, it'll be school A. School A will be the featured blog, and the other three schools will write comments on their blog. And obviously, the platform moves around, and there's a set schedule when everyone comments on your blog. And that really provides an audience for your blog, and it means that kids from all around the world can start commenting and being involved and it just creates that global perspective a bit better. The next thing is Edmodo. Um, we use Edmodo fairly extensively um, throughout IPACA. It was something that was kind of being launched before I came um, and people were using it since. I know Matt was already using it before I came. Um, John Smith was and a few other people. And it kind of, like anything, it has its peaks and its drops and it's, you know, used and not used. But Increasingly, this will be the platform that more things will go on to. In fact, we're already looking in September not to order planners for secondary and ensure that all homework is set on Edmodo. So there'll be more of an expectation for teachers to use the platform to support learning. Edmodo is free to join. Um, you just click sign up as a teacher. It gives you a unique code um, and your students can join the group and discuss on that. Yeah. Edmodo is that's exactly what I'm using it for at the moment because Sat Revision are pointing in the direction of useful sites to go on to help them with their Sat Revision, setting small tasks, saying and also for encouragement to the children of saying to each other, I'm struggling with this bit, you know, just giving them encouragement and, and they're actually it's been really interesting how they support each other as well. Yeah, because I found that with um with the mass I've been using another platform, but um I had a student go um, I can't find a homework term. Before I'd even seen the message, and I'm normally quite quick at seeing stuff, um, and other people replied, I'll email you the link, I've got it. And it's just lovely to see students self-organising in these environments. And that's what they do when you put them in an environment where they're together and they're safe. 
because Modo is safe, you lock the group down once they're in there, um, you know that it's just people inside there commenting, you get this kind of much better ethos, and they know that people are watching, they know that we're monitoring. And also, some children that aren't very good at speaking in class, mm. and putting their hand up, <clears throat> I've got one boy in particular, I've heard say about five words in about six months, he was the first person to comment to this person and say, oh, you put your hand up for that the other day, you were really good at that, and actually it's given him a voice where, where before he hasn't really yeah. found that confidence to have one. And it's really powerful, and, that's what, and you can add, you don't have to just type, you can add um, videos, you can add files, you can add whatever it may be, so I know there's an interesting kind of mm. platform there on how we can share things, especially with younger children, in a much more inclusive way, um, and it will give more people a voice. So I think it's something that um, we haven't pushed on people, but slowly starting to, I know it's being used extensively throughout Underhill now, and I know that science and business and a few other subjects are using it in places. I tend to use Google Drive a lot now. Yeah. Calendar. Yeah. And you can, when you build a website, they can actually set homework through the website as well. Yeah. And yeah, and that, that's that's really powerful in terms of <coughs> thinking. And that you know we've always said it's not about one platform; it's about using what's best to support your class. And I think that's that 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 is exciting. And I think what we need to try and do more is have more cross phase groups. You know, within the digital leader groups cross phase, there's a hundred and twenty digital leaders in the in the environment there, um, and the discussion's interesting. A lot of parents have also <coughs> subscribed to one to to get the messages through on that one as well. So often you'll get a, you know it's a parent even though it's a student. So there's 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 real potential there in terms of what can be done. Um, but what, you know, from your perspective, what is, what is the, are there any issues with online homework at the moment? You know, Matt, do you set much homework um, online? Any homework I do set is all through electronic. Mm -hmm. Also, it's brilliant to can email reminders. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you, are you finding much comeback on that when you send stuff out that our students coming back and saying this works? You know, this yeah, sometimes you know, they get the obvious ones. Like, what's that? Or how do I do this? Or I'm not sure about that. And you can really quickly and easily, maybe again, you know, use my website or mm. send them a link to a video. And it's, it's quite very quick. And no longer do they have to come and try and find you um, to say, oh, I've lost my sheet of paper. What do, or what do I do? I've forgotten. Um, you know, it's, it's all there. Fantastic. This example, which on, on, on my blog actually is, is Martin in um, music, and he's been using the, the Google Forms to do homework. And for him, in particular, in his subject, where it's obviously um, the audio is really important, he's been able to embed YouTube clips inside of the form to then ask questions. So um, that's been quite an interesting approach. And he, as part of an example with year eight, he asked the students to comment on what they enjoyed about the homework, and it was clear that they enjoyed the, the, the fact that it was different, the fact that, that it was more interactive, so the fact they could actually listen to pieces for a piece of homework. Um, so how he's made that is using Google Forms. So if you go on Drive, when you make a Google Form, it's a create option on the left. So when you're signed in with Drive Packer, you can go to Google Forms. Brilliant. Very good. Be useful to know. Yeah. So here you just set up a basic, um, a basic straightforward form. Obviously a title, description, and then you can add in different types of questioning. So there's different options here, um, and within those you can add a, add a video. It's also really good because um, you get all the information back in the spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah, and what you can actually do beyond that with the spreadsheet is you can then have conditional formatting, so you can do it so it marks self marks it for you, so you can say that the correct answer is this or it contains this word, and then it will actually completely mark it for you, which is quite fascinating when it comes in. No. <laughs> the other thing you can do is also if it's something that take, let's take the uh, Nando's example, it's something that's going to be completed over time. Potentially, each one of those Nando's. Um, different homeworks could have a form behind it um, and then you can do on the response form so to see the response form if you go to uh, summary responses 
form again. Wherever the form is. <laughs> do you like form? Oh, there we go. Jesus wants us to actually use spreadsheet. Right. So setting up a spreadsheet. Well, whenever the spreadsheet is, what you can do, here we go, under here, there is a way you can set up automatic alerts. So whenever anything's added to that form, you get an email to say it's been added. So it could be a homework the last whole year. You know, it could you could set something up as whenever you're excited about something you've done in learning, go on, go on and fill this form in. And then instantly you're notified when you get that in. So you haven't got to keep going back checking that spreadsheet. This is how, totally aside from homework, this is how the new e-safety menu works on the website. So if we're going to report to IPACA, this is a Google form. You can embed it within the web page and you can do different themes and different things like this. So if I just put example and if I just submit that, I'll get um, I'll get an email shortly that will tell me that that form has been updated. Um, so you can see many uses for that in terms of you know impact and it's again this isn't or everything we've shown so far is completely free it's completely easy accessible yeah it just gives you a code it just gives you an embed code so if I go here um, <laughs> that's why I kind of jumped out there yeah um, <coughs> I think there's a share. Here you go. Embed here. We are. See, there's your embed code that you can add in to your blog without any problems, and you could email it direct to them. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, you can use a tiny URL and text it out to people as well. That's an option. And when, because it's all linked to your blog, you've laid up all your contacts, mm -hmm. and you can just send it to different contacts. Yeah. Really straightforward, and what you can do now within Progresso is you can send like the link here. Um, in Progresso, in particular, this is more of an issue for secondary. Um, if you've got a class, you can actually tickle and click send email to learners, and then whoever's in your group, you can just send the link code to the thing. Because if your groups are changing quite regularly, that's a nice way of not having to set the groups up in Gmail to start off with, because um, it means you've just always got those people together. Really, are there any questions about? Anything I've shared. It all seems straightforward. I think it is about making sure that there's a variety where possible, that collaboration with different groups of students, different ages, different um, opportunities. Um, it's Mr. McLeod. Hello, Mr. McLeod. How are you? Are you all right? Of course, you're very welcome. Um, so we've got we've got good opportunities there. There's already a range of sites available. We don't we're not saying you have to use a particular thing. There will be different things that are useful. Things like um, Woolwisher and um, Primary Pad and different websites like that, which allow you to have a collaborative whiteboard essentially. So if I get a, I'll show you Woolwisher. These are always good for homework because the kids go home and they see other kids on there and then instantly they want to add and they want to get involved. So it's changed now. It's called Padlet.com. So you can build a wall. And you can just click somewhere and start adding something. So you could you could have discussion on triangles. If I could spell triangles, that would have no. And then you can then instantly start to share this with other people. So we could email it out, we can embed it into a blog, you know, you can put it into different platforms and you can say to the world, This is here, we want you to contribute. And obviously this is very open and it's open to abuse as well, but there are ways you can restrict this so only approved posts can go on and different things like this. We did this, the first time we did this at IPAC was when we had the Wall of Remembrance um, back in 2012, in, in November, and we sent a link out and said, you know, everyone can put their thoughts up onto this wall. And I did that through an approved system, but to be honest with you, nobody tried to abuse it, and I think you kind of have to give a bit of trust there first, because you're going to be checking it regularly anyway to check that no one has. And if something goes up, they generally let you know that, oh, this person has signed in and they've said that. So, Does it say who's... Um 
Um, not on this particular one, but there are different ones that Google support, and obviously you could do this through you could do this for a Google sign in. There's there's loads of websites out there that you can use and link in different groups. You could even do it as a Google Doc just to share thoughts and things. And I think that that opportunity for collaboration is the bit that gets them really excited because especially you, you think about younger children, they go home and they see that Finley and George are both on the dock at the same time. They'll go mad and they'll write loads, sort of thing. So. This. Not with Padlet, no. Yeah. Any? No, they can just do it. They can just um, anyone can do it. Same with Primary Wall. Primary Wall um, is free, but it only lasts for thirty days. So whatever you put up stays for thirty days and it disappears again. Um, but it's kind of deliberate it's because they, you have to pay for the paid version if you want more kind of thing. I mean, you can't change the annoyingly happy background either on the free version. It's a bit too happy, in my opinion. It's not, it's not expensive. Um, register, here we go. I'll find out. Well, it's free and there's a six-month working period. That doesn't quite make sense, does it? It's free and there's a six-month working period. Not sure what the difference is there. But yeah, essentially there are loads of sites that can do this now though. There's loads of mind mapping tool websites. There's mindmap.com. Um, mindmap, if I've got that right. Is mind mapping software that you can work collaboratively on. So this enables you to start off with something. Give it, let's do triangles again. And then go, you can create a branch off that if I remember how to do it. I can't remember how to add a branch. If I was with kids, they go straight away, that's how you do it. This is all entities that you're an expert on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looked great. It looked like it's just happening straight away. Hot keys or something. Right, shift plus enter. So this is mind map. And to add a sibling, you just press shift and enter. And then you've got your siblings underneath. So you can instantly make a mind map. And obviously there's, there's incredible potential here in what you can add and explore and exploit and obviously make it collaborative um, moving forward. Okay, so I, I think um, we're nearly at the time when I can give Guy a call, so I'll give it a go. Um, Stuart... We're going to speak to a teacher in Idaho tonight, um, Dave Guyman. Dave is um, an online teacher. He's moved from the classroom to um, work in an online only school. I'm going to move things around so that he can see everyone. Let's give this a go, shall we? How are you doing? Hey, good evening, Dave. Uh, well, good morning to you. It's good evening. Yeah, it's good evening. I've been for up us. for an hour. Have you? <laughs> what time is it there? Uh, it is now half past four here. Hey? All right. How you doing? I'm doing very well. It's my spring break here. And... I'm just going to spin the laptop around and show you who I've got tonight and let them say hello. All right. um, so I've got Melissa. Hi. I've got Stuart. Hi. Hi. I've got Matt. Hi. I've got Sharon. Hello. And I've got Alex. Hello. All right, and we've just been nice just, to meet you all. We just had a little discussion on terms of what we're currently doing with online learning here at um, IPACA. Um, just to give uh -huh. you a bit, just give you a bit of a background. We're a three to nineteen academy here in um, Portland, England. Um, we've been open for two years now. Oh, well, we're in our second year, um, and uh, we're really excited and um, 
passionate about engaging digital technology in what we do. Our secondary campus, which has 700 children, which is aged 11 through to 16, um, are one-to-one mm -hmm. -one with Chromebooks. Um, so they've got good home access for online tools. And um, we, we, we just want to embed practice a little bit more. And we'd be really keen to hear about your experience, um, both what you did before your current role, what you're doing now, um, and any tips that you can share with us, we'd be really grateful. Yeah, of course. So my, my story is that I was a classroom teacher for the past few years and was asked by our district to join our public online school as the middle school supervisor this year. Um, we're very similar to you in that we're in our second year of being accredited and operating as a K through school in America. That's kindergarten through through the senior year of high school, and um, I I fulfill that role. And then I'm also a, a blogger for a website called GettingSmart.com, which I focus a lot on online learning and emerging technology trends. But it's been a major eye-opening experience for me being in the online setting this year, and especially at a school that is just beginning to get its feet under it, because there are those opportunities to um, enjoy great successes with your students, but then there are also some that have us reconsidering perhaps the structure or the policies in our school, and we can talk about those a little bit more specifically depending on on our conversation goes today. That's great, fantastic. So, in terms of um, your, you know your your daily role, what does that see you doing? So, my daily role is I am in charge of of supervising and monitoring student progress in sixth, seventh, and eighth grades here in the United States. That's middle school, right between elementary school and high school. And as a teacher, I am in charge of, of making sure that our students are on track, um, providing, providing what interventions I can for students who fall behind schedule. Um, throughout the week, we do have opportunities for students to come and meet with me in a face-to-face -face environment at our office. And we engage in activities such as Lego robotics, uh, sporting activities, writing and blogging, journalism type activities. But our focus is to increase that more this coming year. We're going to make a more concerted effort to design a middle school program conducive to what our students want and need. This is the first year that there's really been a uh, specific teacher assigned to um, the middle school before they've just kind of fallen under the elementary school teacher's responsibility. Okay, and um, how do you find um, the difference in approach with an, with an online model in comparison to, you know, the day-to-day -day classroom model? I think the biggest thing that I had to come to terms with and accept is that online learning isn't for everybody. There's definitely a certain, um, a certain set of characteristics that set students up for being more successful in online learning than in the classroom, and some of those... I think number one is that they have to be highly proactive, highly independent, and willing to uh, willing to take the lead in getting their work done. They have to also be willing to or have the ability to manage their own schedule. Uh, and also they have to have the ability to have vision. And, and for instance, I just had parent-teacher conferences with some of our students, and there were some who I had to say, unless you go into... Uh, robo mode here, you're not going to pass the semester because of the choices that you made in terms of your progress, but for some reason they think that in nine weeks they can complete 60% of the curriculum that they hadn't decided to work on until this point. And so ideally any student in our program would possess at least those characteristics, but when one of them is absent, then it has to be made up for by a parent or a guardian, what we call a learning coach. And so in addition to those characteristics of the student learner, it's always a positive thing to have a very strong, very supportive and involved parent or guardian behind them to make sure that they are getting their work done, to help them with their time management skills, to help them set up a schedule that works best for them and so forth. That's great. And in terms of the actual online learning that they're doing, is it is it generally 
um, video based? Is it is it a mixture of content? You know, what 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 kind of content is being presented to them? So we contract with a company called K12. I'm not sure if if you're familiar with them internationally, but they are a curriculum provider um, here in the states, at least. And they have course offerings that are largely text based, but have interactive. Uh, multimedia manipulatives and, and lessons with them. It also incorporates video instruction into into the curriculum. And then to supplement that, I have um, office hours where students are able to get on a web conference blackboard session with me and we can work either one on one for as much time as they would like, or we can work in small groups together as well. So we have that we have that core curriculum that is provided by an educational business, but then we supplement that with the opportunity to at least meet virtually face to face with teachers. And what I've noticed about that is is that the students who take who take on that opportunity provided to them to either come into the office or to get online and meet face to face, regardless of their their relative ability levels coming into the program. Uh, perform and grow a lot more throughout the year than those who just decide to do it on their own. That's fantastic. So do you, do you um, teach people from all over America or just local to you? No, it's, it's mainly in our corner of Idaho, so southeast part of our state. The school was originally set up to serve students within our district, and so I would say that 90% of the students that we serve are within... Uh, 10 mile radius of our office. However, we do have students throughout the state of Idaho that we have accepted into our program for one reason or another. And roughly geographically, how big of an area is that? Um, where I live, it's it's a relatively rural part of our state, and so our students are spread out probably oh, about uh, 20 minutes in any direction majority of them are so they're very they're very concentrated very local but um, we do provide the infrastructure for them to participate in our program we rent out a laptop uh, printer if they need it uh, we have a blended learning room that we're starting to develop at our office that has free Wi-Fi that they can come and use if their if their family's not at home for the day or if they just want to get out of the house even if they just want to come in and work face to face with with a teacher for an hour or two, and that goes through kindergarten through high school. We're available to work with them as they would like. So is this is this model attracting a particular group of students, or is it is it is it broad, or is it? You know, where we're where we're just in our infancy in terms of developing the program. It's very interesting. I often refer to our our student population as a reverse bell curve. We have. Uh, those students that are very high achieving on one end that are really capable of taking this online program and succeeding with it on their own. For instance, uh, in our high school program, we have a handful of students who are set to graduate a year early because of, of their utilization of our online program. But then, unfortunately, at the other end, we have students and parents who um, – incorrectly assumed that online learning was probably going to be an easy way or an easy alternative to classroom learning. And so they're being hit with a really hard reality check that not only is online learning not an easy alternative to the traditional classroom, but it's probably a little bit more demanding, at least cognitively taxing on students, because unlike in a classroom where uh, a lesson lasts one hour and attention is divided between 20 or 30 students. Um, the successful completion of a lesson is entirely dependent on that individual student making his or her way through the course content and completing the assigned activities. That's so we, do, we don't really have many of those students in, in the middle gray area that are, uh, you know, the that are just achieving at an average level, so to speak. So how do you find students um, develop socially? Because I'd imagine it's um, quite an insular way of learning. Yeah, it is. I wrote a blog post for Getting Smart earlier in the year about the surprising social side of online learning. And with our program particularly, we make a really strong effort to 
provide social opportunities for our students. Like I said, at the K through eight level, we have social learning activities for a couple hours every Thursday. In addition to that, we have a PTO or a parent teacher organization who arranges for monthly field trips for the students to go on. And then as a school body, at the beginning of the year, we hosted a back to school night barbecue at a park. Um, shortly after that, we had a camp out up at a local uh, cabin that our district owns that that um, is is built for, to house dozens of people in it. And at the end of the year, we're going to have another big social gathering. So, you know, students, while largely reliant on, on home-based learning, they have at least, would that be five or six opportunities per month to come out and interact and engage in even non-academic activities, whether we take them bowling or, or whatever it may be. Um, however, it, it is optional for them. And so we often see the same students that show up to each activity. And uh, those that don't, oftentimes will call and withdraw because of the social isolation. Dave, can I ask you? <coughs> yeah. Did you, did you learn this from anybody else? Is this completely innovative on your, on your behalf? In terms of the lessons that I've learned in my position, yeah, to to in, I mean, Idaho, the the state setting up this post, and you know, it's a it's a very innovative uh, post to take, isn't it, really? So I'll speak I'll speak on behalf of the of the district and the state. Our school is the only public online offering in the state of Idaho. There are two other private schools, private online schools that uh, students throughout the state can enroll in. Uh, as for what spurred our district to start this online school, I'm not quite sure, but in its first year of operation, for example, with our high school, or, so last year there were 37 students that were enrolled for at least one credit. And at this point this year, we have somewhere near 300. And so the growth at the high school level particularly is astronomical. Our, our superintendent hopes that we have uh, 1,000 high school students within the next two years, which obviously necessitates quite the infrastructure to support that. Wow. And, and, and it's, very, it's very fascinating because our state as a whole last year had an election to or had an election to um, support secondary students, high school students, by requiring that, that every Idaho high school student take uh, a certain number of online courses in in uh, along with their core high school courses in the classroom, and that did, that wasn't passed, and so. Um, generally, it seemed that there was a lack of support for the idea of, of online learning. But now that we have that service offered, we have students that are coming to us full time and those that we call dual enrolled students that are coming to us to take perhaps math online while they're in the traditional high school for their other courses. Um, we see that a lot. Are you, working with, sorry, are you working with other institutions on that to deliver that kind of dual approach? Say that again. Are you working with other institutions to deliver that dual approach? Uh, so our high school uses a software called GradPoint. And I'm not sure what their parent company is. It's different from the K-12 incorporated offering that our middle school has. But in terms of, of administering and supporting that software, it's just our school district that offers that. So we take students from the high schools within our school district that would like to either earn advanced credits or do credit recovery. They can come and take those classes with us for free during the school year or during the summer. We do offer those. I think it's $100 a class. So how do you assess the success of the program, Dave? How do I personally assess it? Or the, the county or of the state or whatever? Yeah, that's a good question because here in Idaho, schools, at least public schools, are subject to a, a five-star rating, one being a very poorly performing school, five being a highly successful school. And um, 
where our district administration knows that we're attracting a relatively low performing or low achieving student population as a large part of our program. Uh, they don't hold us as accountable to that star rating. However, our goal is always going to be to provide equal opportunity and the best education to students and, and especially differentiated instruction to meet those needs of those students who have fallen behind at some point, whether that is in terms of credit or in terms of proficiency levels. And so uh, the way that we assess the effectiveness of our school right now is, is very informal in terms of our staff getting together and looking at data and having conversations about the trends that we see and and the uh, interventions or the design that we'd like to implement this next year. Um, but my principal and I, for instance, are getting together to restructure our middle school policy handbook for parents because we've seen a lot of areas for improvement that would not only make the learning more effective and efficient for the student and parent, but also allow us as a school to set up more supports for them. Thank you. Have you had any feedback yeah. from uh, sort of like the local business community, or have you been open long enough to have sort of you know what the, the students are like in the work environment compared to you know standard schooling? Are you asking? Ask your question again. I'm sorry. Um, basically, have you had any, in, any feedback from the, the business community in in the, the students that come out of this type of schooling compared to standard schooling? Do you have that sort of Not thing? yet, because this is our second year of being an accredited school. So last year we had a small population, maybe uh, eight to ten students who graduated from our program, but uh, we haven't been established long enough to see a longitudinal impact at all. However, we do have students of, you know, the mayor of our city has enrolled her student as a dual enrolled student in middle school and another one in high school. And uh, there are, there, we are acquiring the visibility as a, as a viable option. And we aren't established to, to compete with our other, our brick and mortar schools in the district. Uh, contrary to that, we simply provide another option, particularly for students who just aren't succeeding in those traditional brick and mortar schools. Is it a fee paying, uh, is it a fee paying school or do the state pay for it? Parents have to buy, buy into services. Nope. En enrollment for our school is free. It is funded through the district and, and they get a certain amount of funding from the state for that, just like they do for our traditional elementary and middle schools. Is that how you're able to provide them with things like printers if they need them and stuff? Does the money come out of that kind of budget? No, we, just, we just set up a new budget where um, we're going to be purchasing Chromebooks for our students this next year and replacing the laptops that we have this year. One thing that is very nice in our district is that at the same time that they set up our online school, they developed a technical careers high school. And so as part of that program, they have a track for students who want to go into uh, computer repair, computer design, coding and programming. And so we have those students who are providing the technical support for our students laptops and devices if if one of the hard drives goes bad or a screen breaks or whatever they can bring their laptop in and our technical high school students will fix that for them i'm just thinking at the moment my class are doing controlled technology maybe we could get some of your pupils online to come and do a skype <laughs> meet with them and teach them some stuff <laughs> yeah that would be great um dave i'm really interested in kind of um I don't know what, what the right word is, the psyche, the kind of approach that you have in terms of when you are teaching online. Do you see it as a different approach to, to standing at the front of a classroom with 30 kids? Um, is, it yeah. is there a different preparation involved? <laughs> is, it, um, you know, is it a different mindset, essentially? Yeah, it is. At the most fundamental level, you're not seeing your students' faces, uh, especially when we're on that web conference. We don't use the video functionality of it, and so there is more of a reliance on my ability to communicate verbally and auditorily with students, uh, that does require a different skill set than being able to um, interact and engage in instruction with students and, and assess their engagement and their comprehension with their body language as well as, as other variables. Uh, also, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more 
formative assessment going on. Again, that may be because I don't have all of the sensory inputs of being a classroom teacher. But if you think about it, you have to develop that same trusting relationship with your students that you would in the classroom, but you have to do it uh, virtually. So we, it is quite different. You do take a different personality into it, a different mindset, but also a different set of pedagogical skills as well. Excellent. Yeah, that's what I think. Has anyone got any further questions today? Dave, um, before you go, um, it'd be a perfect opportunity to, to tell us about your book. <laughs> go on, I, give, I us a, give us a plug. Yeah. Well, get some I, more UK I published a book about a, about a year ago. It's titled, If You Can't Fail, It Doesn't Count. It's available on Amazon.com, whatever the, whatever the website in your country is. It's, it's on there in paperback and, and uh, Kindle version. And that book actually led me to pursue the position that I'm in right now. The book, the premise of the book is asking people to reconsider and redefine their concept of failure, not as a termination of, of an end goal, but as a stepping stone to uh, pursuing your passions. And I've been very interested in the trajectory of the book since I've published it, because obviously it's not in a, a New York Times bestseller, but it has led me to be a little bit more courageous in pursuing different opportunities in my personal life and career. And I've found that um, it's a great book to share with students as well, especially those secondary students who are, who are starting to feel around to figure out who they are in life. Fantastic. Well, Dave, can I thank you so much for giving up your time? We really appreciate it. especially when Hey, it's great. I've never been to England before. <laughs> well, I've, I've tweeted up some pictures of you in England already, so you'll be able to see what, who you were talking to and that. And, and seriously, seriously, thank you very much, mate. Yep, and if any of your colleagues there are on Twitter, be sure that you connect them with me on that platform. I will do, definitely. You take care. All right, thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, bye. What an awesome bloke.